Wait, so you're telling me you called this whole meeting to tell me that I'm at higher risk for shark attack because I eat ice cream? Exactly. Ricky, look at this graph. You cannot tell me that this is just a coincidence. Nathan, we live in Idaho. It's 500 miles to the nearest ocean. You know I'm just what? not that worried. Eat your ice cream. I don't care. I will. A few years ago, Jim and I actually did a study where we looked at a whole a bunch of blog content and the amount of traffic that it got. And what we found was that our longer blog posts on average actually brought in more traffic. And that seems to be corroborated by studies like this one here uh, from SEMrush, that the best blog post length was 1,500 to 2,500 words. Wix says here that long form content between 1,000 and 2,000 words gets 77% more backlinks and 56% more social shares than content that's less than a thousand words. Interesting thing though, is in the same case study, it is a few years old, we found though that when we took those blog posts and divided it by the amount of time it took to write them, we actually got the most result for our time on our shorter blog posts. Now to be fair, for us a short blog post <laughs> is over a thousand words. Uh, at the time it was 1,350 words. So I, I guess it kind of agrees with the studies, but it kind of doesn't. So today we want to talk about, does the length of your blog post actually matter when it comes to getting traffic on your website? These studies would seem to suggest so. And uh, we decided that it was time to not do another study. <laughs> so why didn't we do another study, I guess, is the big question here. As I dove in and did research on this video, as we talked about this video, we just realized that <clears throat> word count really just doesn't matter. Wait and a minute. <laughs> doesn't know, the study know, say like everything says everybody is saying that it does. But I think it's really word count can lead to the things in a blog post that do matter, right. which bring the results that people are finding from these studies. Right. I mean, it's clear here, like the longer content does better. Yeah. But if we're going to try to assign like that this cause led to this effect, we have to be able to tie the two together. So if longer blog posts lead to more traffic, just the length, that's what mattered. We could maybe make the argument that somewhere in Google's algorithm, it's looking at the length of the post and saying, longer is better. That's an actual ranking factor. It's not, <laughs> but, but if it were, then you could argue that, okay, longer is what led to more organic traffic. But you can't draw the same parallel between longer blog posts and backlinks, because backlinks aren't generated by some algorithm. They're generated by people literally making a link to a piece of content on your website. What about social shares? Do people share your content just because it's got more words in it? Obviously the answer is no. So there's gotta be something else that's correlating with the length of a blog post that's actually leading to the more social shares, the more um, backlinks and the better organic traffic. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the rest of this video. And just like eating ice cream and sharks <laughs> may have some connection, uh, it, things aren't always what they seem. Uh, but let's dive into... Oh, you know what I think it is? Like, because we, we don't get shark attacks in Idaho. <laughs> right. It's probably because we have potatoes. Yeah, I think sharks are scared of potatoes, right? They must be because otherwise we'd have shark attacks right. in Idaho. Of course. The next part of this video is we just want to tell you, okay, well, if word count doesn't actually matter, well, what do you do about that? How do you know <laughs> how much to write for a blog post? Because there are so many different topics in whatever your niche might be, and it's important that the amount you write matches the query. So word count does matter, but it should be different every time. <laughs> Not, yeah, it doesn't matter in the way you thought it mattered. Longer isn't always better. The length should be the yeah. right length for the content that yeah. you're generating. Okay, so when you're going to write a blog post, how do you figure this out? How do you figure out how much you need to write? Well, first I would look at what have other people done? Uh, there are so many elements that you could dig, dig into. We're just going to share a couple today. But number one, I'm going to look on the SERP and I'm going to see what are other people writing? What's the uh, average or you know what's the kind of the length of the post that they're writing? But not only that, what themes are they including in their blog posts that are making their blog post successful? That's probably the first, thing, the first place I would start. Whatever's being featured at the top of that search engine result page, uh, that is what Google has determined is the best, at least based on what's available yeah. to Google. And so that's a really good starting point. Uh, obviously, we're not fans of like taking what other people did and just copying it. And in fact, we're finding like that's really a bad yeah. move even from a ranking standpoint. But seeing what Google thinks is the best 
and using that as a starting point, I think, is a great idea. And you mentioned one other thing that you do when you are kind of working, I don't know, the beginning stages of a blog post, like mm -hmm. how to determine the length. Maybe you could share that. I thought that, that yeah. was, it was really helpful. Whenever I start off writing a blog post, I mean, this comes right out of a video we made like over mountain. three years ago, uh, where I you know, was riding on a dirt bike and stuff. If you've seen that one. If you kind of an iconic it, video it on is. this channel. For this honestly. channel, it's like <laughs> one of the most recognizable videos. In that video, we showed this exact process, yeah. and this is what I do. You know, I do like to find my kind of high level answer, but then what do I do is I think through what are the main points that I need to make to give somebody a good enough answer to this question. I just write out like what those main points are. Then I can like wordsmith those and turn them into subheadings. But having that outline, mm -hmm. now I know these are the points I need to make. And then under each one, I just write enough information to make the point, and that's it. So I am not thinking, like, when I start a blog post, this is going to be a 1,200-word blog post. I'm thinking, these are the points I need to make, and then I write. And when I'm done, I'm like, oh, yeah, that ended up about 1,300 words. Now, cool. to make that process a little bit easier, mm -hmm. do good research. Yeah. If you know the topic of the blog post kind of before you go into this process, the time is going to be so much faster and easier to get this done. Yeah. Because you're going to have a pretty good idea of what people's question are, kind of their main question, and then what their following questions will be. Right. Now, if you're just brand new to all of this, that's totally okay. Uh, you can still do this. And even if you're not brand new to this, but you're brand new to your niche, um, just get out there and do that research. Another thing that I love now, we don't talk about AI a ton on this channel, uh -huh. but something that I do love to use AI for is idea generation. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, especially if I'm new to a topic, I might just prompt an AI like ChatGPT or something and say, you know, give me a list of things that are surrounding this topic or whatever. Just get a couple ideas. You don't have to use every single thing that it gives you, but take some of the ideas and use that to your benefit. Some of the ideas that you might just not have had because you didn't have the experience. Absolutely. And if you're new to this, I would shoot for a minimum of about a thousand words for a yeah. blog post. We actually tried this. We did this as a case study. We started a new website a few years ago, and we had we trained someone, one person, mm -hmm. to write all the content on this website. But we said, write 750 word articles. Just make them good. You know, be be concise but be thorough. And mm -hmm. here's what we found: we got the same quality of blog post from our writers that were writing 1,300 word blog posts. We just got less information. And those blog posts didn't do as well. Yeah. When Wix says that you know a thousand plus right yeah, yep, is yep. is better to get more backlinks, I, I don't disagree with that. Like it's I, probably I'm true. Almost yeah. never going to write a blog post under a thousand yeah. words, unless it's a resource that has something else content wise that's just not written words. Yeah. Something else in that video that you and Jim quite a while back, that something you talked about was this principle of the extra hour. Yeah. Um, and I really really liked that. It's just this idea that. When you write for the query, when you're not just writing for some work or some specific word count, you can actually uh, take the time, get all the information out there, but then spend an extra hour on the post, improving it, adding those things that make long posts more helpful. And yeah. to me, that's the huge takeaway from all this, is even a shorter post, a thousand words. And I know for some of you that's a long post, <laughs> but that's kind of on the shorter end of posts. So even if like a thousand words or 1,500 words, you can make that post so incredibly helpful by adding things like data, conclusions that are unique to you, maybe that someone else didn't just draw in their blog post and then you took it and put it in your blog post. All of these extra resources, even in a shorter post, will yeah. make your post more likely to get backlinks, more likely to be shared across social. And it's all just probably within about an extra hour you can do right. some of these really helpful things. So some examples of additional resources you could add, some of them in an extra hour, some of them might take a little bit longer. For example, a longer one would be making a video <laughs> that helps to illustrate some of the more visual elements of the blog post. If you're telling someone how to do something, more often than not, a video clip is going to work way better than even photos yeah. um, paired with words. So you can give the instruction in words and even have photos, but then if you could just have a video clip showing it to them real quick, it doesn't, we're not talking about like, you know, amazing cinematography or anything like that. I'm talking about literally like, putting your phone on a little tripod or something that can hold it, point it at your hands while you do the thing that you're trying to explain to them, and that's it. Like, if you want to talk through it, e even better. But if you don't want to worry about audio, just run some music, right, in the background, no big deal. And this can be very, very easy to do. But there are some other things that you can do that work incredibly well. Nathan mentioned data. If you can gather data from official sources, 
Uh, this is probably the easiest way to get data is you can either go to like Google Scholar or you can find a government website with data. They're usually horrible in terms of user experience, but they often have good data. So if you can take their data and put it into a nice format on your website, fantastic. Or you can run your own experiment, all sorts of things that you could do. Sometimes an infographic can help um, people to visualize something that you've been trying to explain. Sometimes I've had numerous blog posts where I wrote it and there was some calculation that they needed to be able to make. And I told them in the blog post how to do the calculation. And then I embedded a little calculator that does the calculation where they just input the fields and it calculates it for them. Those additional resources often will take an extra hour, sometimes even less. Yeah, and a lot of times these resources that you add, you may not be the first one to ever add this resource to this mm -hmm. specific blog post on this specific topic, but it really doesn't matter. If you are doing it from your unique perspective, we've talked about so much lately, the value of us bloggers is that yeah. we bring unique value and perspective, not just rehashing everything that's already out there. Yeah. And so if you do a, a, some research study or you collect data and your data is a little bit different, you have all of a sudden added something unique and new to the internet that just wasn't there. And so even if the current number one ranking article already has a data table, you could do your own research study and prove them wrong or find out that it was very similar. Either way, you're adding that value for the reader. One thing that bloggers are really good at is taking data that somebody's yeah. generated and citing it over and over and over yep. again without actually verifying anything. Yep. And it's not uncommon for the data either to get changed or for the original study to have been poorly done. Yes. And when that happens, everybody's perpetuating what is yeah. a lie, yeah. right? You it's, might find like the first five blog posts on the yeah, server. They, like, they all say all the, the same, same thing. So what do you do? You write a blog post <laughs> and you say, there's some information out there. And I think it's important to address yeah. the original information yeah. because if your response varies widely from what's considered the consensus, Google might think, no, but the consensus is more likely to be correct. And you might not ever rank. So it's important to address it. Like, there's this data out there that exists. I found it very questionable because of my own experience. So I ran my own test or I did my own study or I found government data or whatever it is. And boom, now you present your information and now you're an authority because you did the real work. And all those bloggers that went and gathered that data from somebody else, now they're all going to quote you. And for all of you guys who are Project 24 members out there, you all know what we're talking about. This is something that is pretty commonly addressed within Project 24. But go into phase four of the blogging system and check out the lessons on staple posts. There's multiple lessons talking about various types of staple posts. Now, you've probably already been through them, but go through them again, but thinking through the lens of a shorter post. Take some of the concepts and the principles that we teach in those lessons and apply them to your shorter posts so that you can grab this super value and cram it all into those shorter posts. Awesome. And for all of you who are watching, I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the resources that you've put in your blog posts that have driven the most traffic or gotten you the most backlinks, um, that have gotten you the most social shares? What are those things that are making your blog posts the best that they can be? And one more thing. You may or may not have noticed that even though we're in Idaho, there is a shark in the frame <laughs> of this video. Let us know in the comments if you found it. Time to go eat some ice cream. I guess so. He's not attacking, so. Yeah, we're safe for now. I think so. I like the Neapolitan ones mm. with the chocolate. It's vanilla. like three little. Yeah, it's ice like cream three sandwiches. Ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and the price is right on these. Oh yeah. It's like what, two fifty for a box of twelve or something? They're so cheap. And let's be honest, they're not that great. But <laughs> better than nothing. They're so convenient. <laughs> they are like, convenient. Yep. You don't have to scoop it out uh -huh. into a bowl or anything. Yep. You just unwrap it and eat it. I wonder if anyone will watch us eat these entire things. I don't know. If you're still watching, <laughs> let us know in the comments. How many bites do you get out of an ice cream sandwich? I don't know. I, I ate half of mine in the intro. Yeah, so. I, didn't, I didn't think about <laughs> mine until now. so It's too late. I know how few bites I can have. <laughs> Somewhere between one and two. One and two. <laughs> Plus a brain freeze. <laughs>